From our studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, this is the Psych Bites Podcast. The Psych Bites Podcast is where mental health professionals offer practical psychology to enhance your life. I'm Dr. Craig Pullman, neurodevelopmental psychologist. I'm Jennifer Feitz, licensed professional counselor. This time of year, it would be nice to have an episode devoted to peace, love, and holiday cheer. This is not that episode. For many people, the holidays are not so merry. So we're leaning into that by sharing some grim stories from folks you might expect to be perfectly well-adjusted and strongly connected to family and friends. Mental health professionals! Wah, wah. Hey, we're trained to help people through challenging times, including the holidays, but we're human beings too, and we have baggage. It's not the handbag you carry it in, though. No, no. Not the amount of baggage you have, it's the handbag you carry it we'll, in. We'll have opportunities to, to share a little bit about our baggage in this <laughs> I have episode. Not. What? That's great. That's really good to hear. <laughs> Wrong. But what? I, I'm just curious. So, so, what is your general attitude towards? The Christmas holidays. So I love Christmas. I mean, I, I may be a skosh biased because my birthday is two days before Christmas. So as a smaller human, I used to believe that all the festivities were for me. Sure. Like me and Miss Piggy. All like, the way through Mwah. like high school. <laughs> I chose to be <laughs> less self-absorbed earlier than that. But I mean, I just love, I mean, I, from a faith perspective, Christmas is extremely important to me. Um, I love every aspect of winter in the sense that I love sweaters and I love the romantic idea of crisp fires and warm coffee and all of those things. But then I just, I love what Christmas stands for. I love family. I grew up very lucky that my nuclear family, so my parents and my siblings, we were very close. And I'm significantly younger than my two brothers. So my first brother left home when I was six. And then my next brother went off to college when I was eight. And so Christmas and the holidays meant they were coming home, which mm. was really important to me. So I just have always loved Christmas. I love midnight, late Christmas Eve service. I mean, I just love every aspect about it the chance to unabashedly eat whatever I want. I love it. What about you? I would say that my attitude about Christmas, and this goes back to, to childhood, has been positive but fair. I've, I, I mean, really, going back to being a kid, I've had some negative experiences around mm -hmm. the holidays that have mm -hmm. tempered my enthusiasm somewhat. Sorry. And, no, it, but again, overall positive, um, Christmas is not my favorite holiday. I would, mm. I would say Thanksgiving is. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I, I'm a touch cynical about the commercialism. And, you know, yeah. there's some things that kind of bum me out about it. But I'm a dad, and I like seeing the, the reaction that my, my sons get around the holidays. And, it, and there, there are a lot of great things about it. So. I would agree with you that the one thing that I know that I personally battle is the commercial component of what Christmas foods have become. And the fact that like rolling into Target on October 1st, there is Christmas shit up. Like that drives me a wee bit bonkers. But I think one of the other things that I really love, and I, I don't know what this was like for you, but my parents were really big on traditions. Like, to be honest, we sort of go to the extreme. We have traditions for everything. Um, but I mean, I remember when you and I did that episode about family, right? Like traditions can be extremely important and they can be what can ground people. And it can be really important as you're creating your own family to create traditions so that your kids do have memories and things like that. But we have some really fun, awesome memories that I grew up with and that now I have carried on into my own family. So there were, you know, traditions that I had when I was little. And that's a lot of what I love about there, the holidays. There's, I, I hate to be a cynic, but there's a flip side to traditions, which I think sets up something we want to cover right off the bat here, which are the stress factors yes. around the holidays. Because so, we're doing this whole episode because this is not always such a happy time of year right, for people. Right, yeah. We, we, we're not being Grinches here. We're being realists, and we're, we're here to help people. So um, we came <laughs> up with 10 stress factors around the holidays. And the first one is... It's my favorite. 
communicable illnesses. So just the fact of the matter is... <laughs> we're not we're, just talking STDs, We're people. We're, we're indoors more often. Mm -hmm. It's the cold and flu season. And if you or your child or anyone has an illness, it can definitely sap morale. Isn't that that story that you had from one of our previous podcasts where y'all were over... I've had a few like that. I've had a few <sighs> like... Uh, when one of my sons... I, actually, when Josh was a baby, so he was just a couple of months, I had the most horrific head cold, and we were traveling as well. We're going to get to that in here in a second. And it it almost ruined Christmas for me. It was just I think terrible. I remember that. I think that's a story. Did you this guys end up in a, a hotel? This, Gosh, there's more than one? Yeah, this is— Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So that, that that's one we have to acknowledge. Um, financial stress. I mean, this time of year, I think sometimes people, and this gets to that commercialism, feel a great deal of stress to buy— a lot of stuff for people that we've gotten into this idea that gift giving is the only way to show appreciation and love and affection or I mean the anomaly I just got hit up you know this past week with um, all the money for teachers gifts for school and that people may end up spending outside their means putting a lot of money on credit cards that then brings about later debt or feeling like maybe they are um, really trying to be fiscally responsible and they end up feeling like they're not able to provide for family the way that other kids are. I mean, there can just be a lot wrapped up into the monetary component of what the holidays have become. For sure. And and uh, we should also say we're going to share some tips for dealing yes. with stress factors later in the episode. So this is the more pessimistic part right now because there, there are things that you can do to yeah. mitigate all this. Oh, yeah. Third stress factor, alcohol consumption. I have let's, no idea what you mean. Let's just – Goody two shoes. Mm -hmm. Let's just acknowledge that there are a lot of holiday parties, uh, work parties, neighborhood, whatever, and alcohol consumption can go up, and that can lead to problems. That can lead to negative interactions. That can lead to hangovers, mm -hmm. and uh, and just you know. In vino are... veritas, in wine there is truth. Right. So sometimes but... we say things that perhaps we uh, would have kept to ourselves. Exactly. Otherwise, so. um, which ties into a little bit of eating and body image. For some individuals, um, this time of year brings about more eating than maybe people normally would. And then eating types of foods that are sugary, fatty, lots of desserts and treats and things like that, which can really lead for some people to issues with their own body and how they look and body image. And, and for a lot of people... Uh Food, cooking, baking, it's a love language. Oh, it is. And, and that's how people deal with the financial stress mm -hmm. is they mm -hmm. bake things. And so, you know, at our office, every day we've got baked goods mm -hmm. here. That is just the whole month of December it's out there. And it's very nice, very thoughtful and tempting. Well, and I think for some people what can also then be difficult is like I have a colleague who can consume all of those baked goods in one sitting and would not adversely affect their figure. And – I would do that, and my ass would exponentially grow with each bite of brownie that I had. So I think it also then plays into this comparison game, and and you have in the mix, we'll talk about this later, then we have all of these parties and things, and so can, people can really end up feeling self-conscious or less than or just that they begin to get really discouraged about their own physical appearance. Our fifth stress factor is change of rhythm including exercise routine. Mm -hmm. And for, for some people, you know, throughout the year, they've got, they've got a routine, uh, say, with exercise that helps them, uh, you know, it, it, exactly. It, it's, it's a positive thing. And that can get thrown out the window on the holidays. Mm -hmm. Ch schedules change if you're traveling. And, and also just not even just exercise, just having a different uh, routine, schedule, whatever, can be really stressful for people. Well, and... I would say if you're a parent, these things happen at school too, right? Kids' rhythms right. get way out of whack so with right. holiday parties and you've got concerts and all these things, which then either makes them more tired, more irritable, which then throws off your rhythms. And I mean, I know in our family, we really like to have at least one day of the week where we're doing like nothing, like everybody just lays low. And a lot of times based on holiday parties and, and just things that you have to do or even – errands that you have to run or different things, those quieter moments of the weekend go by the wayside, which can then throw off your rhythm and increase, you know, irritability and lack of sleep and all of those things. So Absolutely. it can compound. Yep, for sure. 
um, which then also changes in weather. So for people who don't realize it, seasonal affective disorder is a thing. It's actually real. Mm -hmm. It does impact the chemical levels of those happy hormones in our brain. So dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, all the things that we like and our brain likes can get affected with the decreased amount of sunlight. Sometimes we have really yucky weather in the winter, which causes people to be more indoors or even less active. Like in the kind of way, if you are a person that wants to be out interacting with people, you sometimes get stuck indoors way more than you want, which can then affect people's mood. And, and affected at different levels, yeah. different, to different degrees. Like mm -hmm. you could have full blown, wow, I need treatment for this. Or just the, the, the shorter days, colder weather just, just dampens your mood. And I would say, you know, I mean, I could speak on my husband's behalf. He has the type of job where he leaves the house when it's dark, and then now he comes home when it's dark. And he really feels like he never sees sunlight. And that can be discouraging. And so for a lot of people, if they're working a more traditional, like, 9 to 5-ish kind of job, that can really hit them. For sure. So the number seven stress factor, entertaining. <laughs> and, the, and, you know, throwing a party is a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And also entertaining just having guests over if you're, you know, out-of-town guest family. Uh, and, and, and that's it's stressful on a number of levels. It, it does hit you financially. It hits you in terms of planning time, cleanup time. I got to tell you, we, we had for years back in my hometown of Montana, we had a holiday party every year. And I don't know how we ever made it through year after year, how we kept doing it because between my brother, my mom, and was my Was this step your mom or your dad? This is my mom Mom's and stepdad. Dad, okay. Yeah. So the four of us, we always had fights leading up to the party in terms of planning. And then we and then we had a great time at the party. And we always had fights the next day about cleaning up. So, But isn't it funny that you guys kept doing it? I mean, I think so. This, this must be a little bit of, of insanity. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. But that it must be, you know, is that a piece of what you were referencing around this idea of traditions? Right. Of getting stuck yeah. with something. But I think, too, um, that entertaining piece can also feed into people's social anxiety and there's so much pressure around what we're supposed yes. like and I, this is what I don't love about the holidays is all these supposed to's have right. said we are supposed to do this you know that's we're the flip side of tradition uh-huh that's the dark side of of traditions yeah okay so with sometimes entertaining comes travel the stress that comes from just Getting to where you need to be, increased traffic on the roads, increased traffic at the airport, sometimes traveling with kids, and it can feel like what is supposed to be exciting and fun has become completely burdensome, like a disaster. I would say just like an important safety tip for listeners, only travel with children if you have to. <laughs> don't, Otherwise, like, just leave them at home. Don't like, no. yeah. Don't rent kids to take with you on trips. It's not going to add do anything to these. Do that? No, I'm just, I'm just. I was going to say. I mean, it's, nothing would surprise me anymore. You do rent get a to kid. a certain. I, I don't know where you are. My my, my sons are now uh, 16, 13, and nine. They travel really well. Yeah. If we fly or in in, in in if we go if we drive somewhere, they're really great. But when your kids are younger, it's a nightmare. It's a headache. Oh, I, I we got we sort of put into this. Um, rule, which was actually kind of great. It worked out with our family dynamics that, you know, my oldest brother, when he started having kids, he put the kibosh when they're little on traveling. Like if, if anybody wants to see us, y'all are going to come right. to us. And so once we then had kids and we were lucky because then being 10 years and eight years younger, then once we had the little humans, they had to come. But we just, my husband and I just decided at one point, like on Christmas morning, we're in our own house. Right. And that's just a rule that we put in place that... Here's what this is going to look like. We, we made a similar decision. Maybe we might come back and talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. So number nine stress factor, interacting with extended family. And hey, sometimes there's so it's many great, things just in that sentence. But sometimes it's you know it, it connects with travel. You might be stuck in a house. I say stuck. I, I chose that word carefully. You might be you know in close quarters with people you're just not around that much. And you don't get along with that well, you, or you've forgotten. You're out of practice with getting along with certain people, and things can surface, and you can have some really difficult interactions, conversations, whatever. Well, I think a big piece of it too is that depending on your personal family story and history, right? That holiday extended family time can breed a lot of inauthenticity, like that that people do not feel like they can be their authentic selves. They have to put on this 
front of whatever mom wants to hear or whatever my father-in-law wants to hear or this pressure that your kids have to be extremely well behaved like right there, there's there can really build this increased level of what what would look like social anxiety and stress around you know, or waiting. I mean, I know that sometimes, like, I get very worried about, like, I know that there's this X person that may say something in front of my kids, right? So I have anxiety because I'm always waiting that I'm going to have to mitigate, you know, what what uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so may say. And it's like, oh, uh, uh, you know, so I mean, I just think that in general, the extended family pressures, because there is so much of this people's idea of what this is supposed to look like. Well, that sets up our 10th stress factor, which is fronting and meeting expectations. So this whole idea of putting on this, who am I? This, this perfect version, I would call it the Instagram version of what your family looks like. And you brought up when we were talking before about this, like the Christmas card, my husband Mm -hmm. hates the picture Christmas card because he's like, you know, it's voyeuristic in nature. You don't really care about who you're getting the card from. You only want to look at the pictures, you know, and that we try to, you know, I'm always stressed out about finding the right picture. And I totally fall, like I fall victim to this. I want our Christmas card every year for people to open it up and be like, oh. You know what occurs to me? Is this this tradition or whatever, this routine of sending the picture Christmas cards, Mm -hmm. Didn't the advent of that come about about when social media oh, was coming 100%. online? So 100%. it's the same mentality, right? Yep. I mean, because I remember sending uh, uh, holiday cards that you I just bought at Walmart or whatever. Oh, or, yeah. or you Or I guess you could order them. But the, the customizing them, you might throw it. I might throw in my own photograph in there. But it's but to create the card with your family shot in there, that's mm-hmm. an Instagram, Facebook phenomenon. But what I think is funny, though, is I remember my parents pouring over the Christmas letter. So when oh, right. they would send out their Christmas cards, it would have the, like, letter that went in it every year that highlighted all the things that my brother and I had done that year. And we moved a lot. So like where, you know, where in the world was team chief. That's my maiden name like that year. So it was always like, you know, but so there's been still this thing about what the Christmas card is supposed to be or mean. It just has shifted now that we have all of this accessibility for pictures. And I, I mean, the one perk that I loved about having kids is that I no longer have to be on the card it can just be the kids. Truth. <laughs> so, okay, kids, not great for travel. Awesome to put on Christmas cards. Awesome for cute factor yes. on front of Christmas yes. card. So, All right. You know, as we mentioned up top, we've got some stories to share, not just our own. And so let's queue up our first one. Word. And so we've got Elise Howell now. Elise is a licensed professional counselor and writer who has been on previous episodes of our podcast. Let's hear her holiday tale. Christmas Eve was the day after my husband Stephen and I got back from our honeymoon in 2011, and we just had a nice relaxing week in the mountains, and we were about to spend the holidays with the majority of my very large extended family in Ohio, and this would have been Stephen's very first time meeting a lot of them. Even my uncle and his family from Australia were coming into town, and since not everyone was able to come to the Carolinas for our wedding, they were all really excited to meet Stephen and celebrate Christmas. And he had never been to a Christmas with us before, and our Christmases are very festive and a little chaotic, too. We're all about Christmas. There are always trays and trays of Christmas cookies, parties every night between Christmas Eve and New Year's. Christmas music playing constantly. We do Christmas carol sing-alongs, and everybody plays an instrument. And it's just, it's a great party all the time. But usually because with so much going on, there's some kind of mishap like food burning or a pet getting into desserts. And there was one year, my three siblings and I, we all had the flu and it was just a mess. But my parents decided we were going to Ohio anyway because you can't miss Christmas in Ohio. But so, but for Stephen's first Christmas, it seemed that that year we had just exponentially the amount of incidents than than normal. And so he got a true welcome into the family, and we survived the chaos with only a week of marriage under our belts. It started with Stephen and I getting a flat tire somewhere in the middle of Kentucky on our way to Ohio. And it was that kind of flat tire where it wasn't totally busted, and we could drive for a little bit and then stop to refill air in the tire. So that eight-hour trip took about 12 hours. 
And once we arrived, the disasters just kept coming. Um, My cousin's dog got into someone's suitcase, which had a stocking full of chocolate and some medications that are not great for dogs. And by the time we got back from an outing that evening, this poor dog's eyes were bloodshot and she was just kind of manic looking and she had gone to the bathroom and thrown up in different spots around the house, including Steven's guitar case, which he had brought his guitar along to be a good sport and participate in the sing-alongs. My younger cousin threw up on another in another cousin's car when we were going to our annual ice skating downtown Cincinnati. My sister and her boyfriend broke my grandparents' dryer. I also think they brought their tarantula that year, which just was weird, and we were all worried about the tarantula getting out. My grandpa, unfortunately, had to spend a few days in the hospital for having too much fluid around his lungs, and he was distraught one night when he thought that we forgot to pick him up when we were all going to the Nutcracker Ballet. And then at my aunt and uncle's house, where most of the parties take place, they had a steep driveway and hill in the front yard, which resulted in my cousin's car getting stuck and my uncle's having to push it out of ice and mud. And then on New Year's Eve, as the rest of us were counting down to midnight, my dad and my uncle were trying to stop several toilets from overflowing in my grandparents' house as the cold weather has messed up the pipes. So everybody, we were all a little extra extra frantic and stressed that year, trying to do damage control, and by the end of the week, definitely more exhausted than we had ever been. I can't remember, there were more things that happened. Honestly, I can't remember them all, but family legend is that there were at least 12 things that happened that holiday season, so much that my uncles felt compelled to record a 12 Disasters of Christmas song to document it. And I tried to find the video on the internet just as I was preparing for this podcast to remember everything, but thank God it was taken down. Some YouTube trolls had definitely found that and were commenting some unkind things about how what a mess my family was. And so Stephen definitely had moments where he was very overwhelmed, sometimes by the amount of people, other times by the chaos. Um, But in the midst of that chaos, there was a very special moment, and my grandpa was still in the hospital when it came time to leave town after we had already fixed our car tires. And Stephen and I went there to spend some time with him and say goodbye. And as we walked him around the hospital, he announced to every staff person he knew, this is my granddaughter, they just got married, and he was just so proud. And when we turned to leave, he took Stephen's hand and he said, thank you for marrying Elise and we love you. We're glad you're part of this family. And my grandpa and I were very close. He was my person and he passed away about six months later. So this moment in the hospital, um, in the midst of all of this chaos, ended up being the very last time I saw him. And I've held that moment very dear and close to my heart. And so as stressful as this last Christmas with grandpa was, I remember it as one that squeezed in a lot of last memories and laughs and enough stories and chaos to carry us through the Christmases ahead without him. A Christmas that truly has been unforgettable and we still talk about. And so Stephen and I not only survived our first Christmas, but had a chance to experience a very true Effler family Christmas. And my grandpa's favorite song to sing in these sing-alongs was the 12 Days of Christmas. And when we'd sing it together and everyone had their own part, his line was five golden rings. And in our family remix that year of the 12 Disasters of Christmas, that line was replaced with puke in the car. But disaster or not, it will always be our family's trademark Christmas song. And I'll never forget my grandpa's voice booming through that line. Again, that was Elise Howell with what her a, story. What a great story. It, you know what is funny is that there were mo- – I mean, I cried listening to her story, specifically the moments that she shared about her grandfather. But I found myself incredulous listening to all the disasters. But what I find is unique and I think is so resilient about the human spirit is that what she really took away from that story was this precious memory that she had with her grandfather, which I think is what I always love about the holidays. And I realize that I may have a completely naive, over-romanticized view, but I think there's something about that. Like she could be really remembering how disastrous that was, all the things that went wrong and it sounds like she has an acute memory of some of that, but that that memory with her grandfather and sometimes what the holidays can bring out in people. Well, well I think that a lot of the memory has been encoded in song. Yeah. So they have a mnemonic device in their family to help remember it. Which, and you'll have to excuse, I have 
brought my own sleigh bells to this part of right. the Right. Yeah, for those of you, you just see. listening, you're you're not experiencing an auditory hallucination. I, is, I told you I love me dawned. some uh, festivus for the rest of us around here. Right. I'm like excited. Yeah, go to check out the YouTube video if you want to see what's creating that sound effect. You know, uh, one of the reasons I love this story is this kind of captures my balanced view of the holidays. Now, a lot of the risk factors or stress factors we talked about are embodied in here. Problems with food, travel stress, being with extended family, illnesses, weather, and then one that we didn't include, pets. <laughs> Ill, Ill pets. That could be crazy. But that, despite all of that, you have this really special, sweet moment between Elise and her grandfather and Stephen. It's great. Well, and I really, I mean, that that also that fronting, right? Like, obviously, because, yes. I mean, I have to be honest, as I was listening to her to describe all that they fit into one week. I mean, they went ice skating, they went sing along, we went to the Nutcracker, we went, I was like, holy banana, she wasn't kidding. And I think sometimes we do feel the sense of urgency that we have to do all of the things. There's all right. there's all the things we have to do. We have to go to the Nutcracker, and we have to go ice skating, we have to, right? Because And there's a lot of fun things to do with the holiday, but like, oh man, that just added to the stress right. of what was going on. And let's, I, I, wanna, I wanna make that, that point again that Traditions can be great, but the dark side of a, of a tradition is it sets up these expectations and this this rigidity. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is a, a good moment to, to share a tip that we have for helping survive the holidays, and that is flexibility, to yeah. embrace flexibility. Yeah, because I, I mean, and I know that this is something that I fall victim to and have had to work really hard, right? Because as I've said, I, I love the traditions and I have a thousand of them in my head. But when I'm working with a client the other 364 days of the year, right? One of the things that I always say as a goal is part of my job is to teach you emotional and psychological flexibility. Change is the only constant. If you ever want to be able to like hang your hat on anything, it's the idea that change is always going to be there. And so it's not a bad thing to have traditions and it's not a bad thing to have an expectation in your head and it's not a bad thing to say this is what I really hope happens but we have to be able to not personalize it when things don't go the way that it's supposed to do it's one of the top 10 thinking errors is over personalization and the idea to go okay can, you know can I go ahead and just be oh you know sad or disappointed that this thing didn't go the way that it did, but that I don't then allow it to ruin my holiday or ruin somebody else's holiday, right? That I can go, okay, this didn't go the way that I wanted it to go, but I can be flexible and then do, you know, X or Y or Z different, or that I don't assume that somehow I've failed the holidays because our outfits didn't match for our Santa pictures. Not that that's ever stressed me out. <laughs> and so, so both my wife and I, both of our parents are divorced. So the first few Christmases as a couple, we took two weeks and visited all four sets of parents. Now that was doable for two young adults, and then we added kids, Humans. and so we had to go to just one, either Montana for my family or to the East Coast for for her family. But then we would split the two weeks amongst two between two places with young children. We did that once and said never again. We and and that and one of the expectations we had to deal with there was that of our parents or the grandparents, and mm -hmm. let them know that we just can't do this anymore. Christmas has to be about our home and the kids waking up around our Christmas tree. It's, those jingle bells are so awesome. You're shaking sorry. your head in agreement. <laughs> so um, but I think you also highlight a good point for maybe the multi generational people. Like my husband and I have been very blessed that our parents, so the two sets of grandparents never gave us a hard time when we said we're going to be at our own house on Christmas morning. And I think, you know, my brothers and I live very far apart. And we never assumed that when one family said we're not coming, that it wasn't because we didn't want to be with them. That's good. But that, right? So, I, so, I mean, that is one of those things that sometimes, depending on the humans that are in your life, you may not get that kind of grace. And so that ability to know what your own boundaries and values are and to say that that's not a you problem. Like, it's okay to say, we're not going to go anywhere other than our own home for Christmas. And if other people have a problem with that, then that to me sounds like a little bit of a them problem, not a you problem. Right. And it's okay to set boundaries right. around the holidays and say, yes, we're going to do that or no, we're not going to do that. We're coming to learn our oldest is starting to get a little overwhelmed with really large crowds. 
like he's entering a stage where that sort of stresses him out. And so we're just trying to be mindful in this current stage of his life. Like maybe we're not going to do the blow it out Christmas party shenanigans because that may not be great for him right now. And maybe that'll change at another point in time. But, you know, and I think that that's okay. It's right. okay to be flexible. Well, you need to be flexible. And then it's okay to set boundaries. Embrace flexibility. And boundaries, too. That's that's a good part of it. Yes. All right. Let's go to our next story, which is from Jonathan Hederley, a licensed professional counselor, author, and co-host of the Shrink Tank podcast. Christmas is one of the happiest times for my family and me. But that doesn't always mean each Christmas is a joyous affair. One year, my wife and I had decided to accelerate my graduate studies. So I quit my full-time job. We sold our house and moved in with her parents while I aggressively completed my first master's degree. At the time, our first daughter, Caitlin, was two, and we soon discovered that my wife, Julie, was expecting. And then, less than two weeks before Christmas, tragedy struck. My father-in-law died suddenly from a ruptured aorta. My wife and I were awoken to the sound of a loud, jolting coughing. We went downstairs to my in-law's master bedroom to see the horrific sight of my father-in-law coughing up blood and struggling to breathe. He died shortly thereafter, less than two weeks from Christmas. My wife was roughly six months pregnant. My oldest daughter would turn three two months later. That Christmas, our only focus was to attempt to make it joyous and memorable for my young daughter. To this day, My wife and my mother-in-law barely remember anything about that Christmas. We were all a shell of ourselves, drowning in shock, grief, and loss. Every year, leading up to Christmas, I expect my wife to be hit with a measure of grief and longing, struck by the absence of her father during the most wonderful time of the year. Christmas continues to be the happiest time in my life, but it's okay if the holiday season doesn't always feel cheery and celebratory. Sometimes you can't escape factors that spoil the joys of the holiday season. And sometimes you gain perspective of how important family and happiness is by experiencing the other side of joy and happiness, which is sorrow and sadness. This story from Jonathan Hederley really struck and, you know, it was heartbreaking to hear. And I think, though, highlighted some really key things that are important for us to talk about that can happen at the holidays. You know, so this story struck two weeks before Christmas. I think he said 13 days. So this was a a gut-wrenching, painful, tragic loss right at the holidays. But for some people, Christmas is so painful because it's the first Christmas or a, a what is supposed to be a joyful holiday after a loss, right. the loss of a child, the loss of a spouse, the loss of a partner, a parent. And so it, it could can, be a loss or a divorce. Or a divorce. Or some, I mean, just, there are all yeah, sorts of ways sort of that tri- suddenly there's yeah. a black hole. A void. Yes. When there's always so much attention. I mean, you think of all the famous Christmas movies are all about the coming together. Right, like romantic comings together or lost family members coming back home, I mean, whatever it would be. And for some people, that's just not the truth. Or that for some individuals, the most painful experiences of their life have been at the hands of their family, either abuse or assault or rejection or, you know, painful, narrow minded judgment, whatever it would be. And so the holidays can be really painful. For some people, yeah. and and I think what's important for us to be mindful of that. There are two things that that struck a, a note of hope for me in in Hedley's story. One was how they they sort of rebuilt Christmas around the experience of their children. Mm-hmm. So that was really sweet. I mean, mm-hmm. it, they made it about them, but then mm-hmm. they they drew strength from that. The second thing was um, his appreciating the contrast. So really sad, tragic time, um, but it it makes the happiness more poignant. The, mm-hmm. the yin mm-hmm. and the yang, mm-hmm. as they say. And and how great of him to be able to see that, right? We talk about the both and as opposed to the either or. Like it can be both sad and joyful, and it doesn't have to be one or the other. They don't negate one another. And I love 
yay husband points to Hetterly that he really gives his wife space. Yes. That if it if it's painful, and I think that that's a good note for us to have. That sometimes, depending on what our, you know, family or friends have been through, that we need to give them that space. That this may be a really tough time of the year, and so when the rest of us want to be consuming large quantities of baked goods, that other people may just really be struggling to get out of bed, right? And to give that space and grace to so people. That's a good tip. I think mm-hmm. if you're in a relationship with your significant other, check in with that with that person. Find out what their needs are. It's not just your needs. If you've got family members, even your kids. You know, we, we've got in our family, we've, we've got a, a, a big change coming up in how we spend Christmas Eve. And my wife and I, we need to make, make sure we get the opinions of our sons about that. So we're not just imposing it upon them. You know, I think this would be a a good moment to share some of the research about the holidays and psychopathology and some research about um, incidents. And from a 2011 study, this was a meta-analysis from Innovations in Clinical Neuroscience. It was called, the study was called, or the paper was called, The Christmas Effect on Psychopathology. Psychopathology. So, So obviously what I find so striking about this is that there's enough psychopathology not to be redundant around christmas just itself that right. it that it and then i mean a meta-analysis for those people that don't live in the research world that's when somebody's taking a global look so meta at all of the different research that's out there and sort of almost accumulating it right it's a study of studies there you go all around mental illness mm-hmm. and a co- few conclusions One is that there is an increase in certain types of psychopathology during the holidays, specifically mood disorders. Mm -hmm. So we're talking depression would be the biggest example of Mm -hmm. that. And alcohol-related fatalities. Which speaks back to, you know, these these stressors, right? People sort of abuse alcohol during this time of year. And, you know, the mood, I think the other piece of it would also be anxiety. I mean, going back to that expectation, right? Right. Just the increased levels of this. What I found so interesting, so in this... um, paper, why did that word just leave my brain? It said, you know, in contrast, there's a decrease in the overall utilization of psychiatric emergency services and admissions, a decrease in self-harming behavior, and a decrease in suicide attempts and completions. And what is interesting is that I would disagree. I do think there's this really strange honeymoon period, like right at Christmas or right at Thanksgiving. But I can tell you in the disordered eating world, like... The day after Thanksgiving or the day after Christmas, you see a major increase in pathological behavior. And, you know, in suicide now, I feel like we need our colleague, Dr. Amanda McGowan here, dropping some, like, major statistical research on us. But I feel like from a actual treatment perspective, a, like, in-the-trenches treatment perspective, that I would say that the self-harming behaviors and suicidality would, is increased. What I didn't get from this article, I don't remember, it was the time frame they looked like. Well, what do they consider Christmas time? Yeah. But they did also conclude, and this gets to your, your clinical experience, mm-hmm. that these whatever decreases they found in self-harm behavior, suicide attempts and completions, psychiatric emergency visits, those rebound following the holidays. So it's like people repress right up to Christmas Eve, mm-hmm. maybe even New Year's Eve, and then the day after all hell breaks loose. Well, and I think it's, you know, two things play into that is that one is that what we talked about, that fronting where people feel this immense amount of pressure to do or be whatever the expectation is. And that then there can be so much pain and regret around the holidays that people really crash afterwards. And I mean, I know that I consider myself and those of you that may know me well may disagree, but to be a generally squared away emotional human being. Craig, you may disagree. Um, (laughs) But that I even feel some sense of melancholy when we have to take the trees down, you know, when everything has to go away for another year, that all of the magic, and I do, you know, I believe in the Christmas magic, that, I mean, I feel this sense of like, oh man, I got to wait a whole nother year, you know? So you could see for somebody that maybe did struggle on a regular basis with depression or maybe drinking to salve some of those emotions that you would really then see an increase in that. So an awareness to, to be able to ask for help if you need it. Right. Including professional help. Yeah. And schedules get crazy, but if you're a person who is in uh, in regular therapy or counseling, don't take the time off on the no. holidays. Keep yeah. it going. Yep. 
um, make sure that's built into the schedule that that's your you're keeping the oxygen mask on yourself so you can take mm-hmm. care of others. Which is one of those other tips that we had talked about, you know, that we'd use the word in one of our past podcasts about this idea of margin. But that during this time of year, I think a really helpful tip for people to remember or to recognize is that you don't have to say yes to everything. You don't have to go to every party. You don't have to do all of the cookie making with your kids or whatever Pinterest is telling you the right thing to do this kind of year. Or Instagram or whatever. Oh, yeah. That it's okay to say no. It's okay to put boundaries in place. And that if you need some extra help or support this time of year, that it's that it's a good thing to ask. And that don't let, if you've got a good therapy schedule or you have a good exercise regime or whatever it would be, like, don't let that lapse. And right. keep that margin in place. Right. I, I, we should note that these stories that we've heard, uh, we had Elise and then Jonathan Hederley, mm-hmm. we have not heard them before no. this moment. Right before. So our, our reactions are in real time. But we did get a hint that the next story is going to be a little more upbeat. <laughs> We're not going out hopefully, on the Debbie Downer. Hopefully producer Brandon did not pump fake us on I that can't one. can't cry anymore. So our final story is from Dr. Melissa Miller, a licensed psychologist and film producer. It was Christmas Day, 2016. One of our neighbors is a sweet 85-year-old woman who lives alone with her little Scotty dog. She is always so thoughtful and has a history of bringing the perfect gifts, even though we don't know her very well. So I wanted to make sure to do something really nice for her this holiday. I found this mouth-watering chocolate set that I knew she would love. I went to deliver it two days before Christmas, but she wasn't home. I tried again that same night. Again, she didn't answer the door. The next morning, I tried once again, and since she still didn't answer, I left it on her doorstep where I was sure she was going to see it. Except she didn't see it. And I started obsessively checking out my window to see if she had collected her gift. It was an unseasonably warm December, so I was very concerned about meltage with this chocolate. Christmas Eve, I made my husband go across the street to see if she had been collecting her mail, and she had, which meant that she just wasn't looking down when she opened her door. Christmas Eve actually brought a big thunderstorm with quite a bit of rain, and this is an important detail for later. On Christmas Day, she still had not picked up her gift, and it was driving me nuts. Our kids were little then, and they had gotten bikes for Christmas. We were outside on our street watching our kids ride their bikes when I noticed our neighbor in her driveway. I had a ham in the oven as we were hosting Christmas lunch in just a bit for family. I yelled to my husband to go talk to her and show her that she had a gift on her front step while I ran inside to check on the ham. I came out a little while later to watch the kids and join the conversation with our neighbor, but my husband and my neighbor, they were nowhere to be found. After about 45 minutes, the kids were ready to come inside, but still no sight of my husband. After about an hour, my husband comes running inside to grab the keys to his car and his phone, saying he has to take our neighbor to urgent care. It turns out, when he walked her to the front step to show her the package, she walked up the path which had become very muddy and slick from the thunderstorm the night before. As she tries to step up on the porch, she slipped, she fell, and she couldn't get up. My husband had to pick her up and carry her inside to her couch. She called her daughter, who lives in town, with no luck. My husband wanted to stay with her until he knew someone could care for her. But her pain was getting worse and worse. She decided she needed to see a doctor, and since they couldn't reach her family, my husband said he would take her. So off they went to urgent care, just as we were setting the table for Christmas dinner with his family, who has traveled from Florida to be with us. And urgent care is shockingly busy on holidays, and with no response from her family, my husband spent four hours with her waiting to be seen. The x-ray showed that she had actually broken her foot and leg in three places and was in need of surgery. Finally, her daughter called and was able to come relieve my husband. But when we found out what had happened and everyone in our house named my gift the death by chocolate and thought it was really funny to kid me about stealthily attacking our sweet elderly neighbor... The poor woman was in a rehab facility for 10 weeks after her surgery recovering. And to this day, every time I see her, she gushes about how wonderfully valiant my husband was to help her on Christmas and how kind and amazing he is. Her hero. 
And thankfully, she has never said that it was all because of an ill-placed gift by me. And that was Melissa Miller. <laughs> Whew, bless your heart, Melissa. Well, I mean, I, I think the funny thing is, is if you know Melissa, she genuinely to this day, I don't know how many years. Did she say how many years ago that was when she was telling the story? I don't think she actually said. But like, I guarantee you it could have been 50 years ago and she would still feel bad about it. Guilt is an emotion with which Melissa is intimately familiar. <laughs> So we love you, Melissa. Yeah, we. Um, and shout out to Matt. Oh my gosh, knight in shining armor, paladin. You know that the old lady is now like macking on him from across the street, right? Trying to move in. Yeah, hey, yeah. cougar. Melissa's got some kind <laughs> cougar. You never imagine an octogenarian cougar. <laughs> nope, nope. Can I um, see that? But uh, I, I mean, I. I feel like those mishaps, I mean, people have these stories of things that happen to them. And I can just imagine for that woman and then her daughter, like just that they see this probably from a completely different lens than right. Melissa and her family do. So, so you know, th this, this story captures one of the stress factors of food. And I think we should expand communicable illnesses to just medical problems, <sighs> injuries. Medical disasters. Um, yeah, because that's that, that was rough. Oh, and we've, so bad. And we've had sick kids. You, you, you uh, well, both. I mean, the That's funny really thing stressful. is, we, I have been very lucky. I mean, we have a funny family story from Christmas with my brother. So, my oldest brother, who's 10 years older than I am, I said my birthday was at Christmas. So, the year that I was going from six to seven, I got the Barbie Dream House. My parents bought the Barbie Dream House. And so, he got busted for breaking curfew. And his punishment was as opposed to my father on Christmas Eve night having to stay up until the wee hours of the morning, snapping out all those little tiny pieces of plastic that how we used to do it in the 80s, that my brother was the one that had to stay up and do that. And so that's, we have funny family lore, but we don't, I, to be honest with you, have no other really awful, negative, terrible holiday Christmas stories. Well, I've got one. I know. I'm like, ooh. So my story relates to the the fact that oh I just hit the mic sorry sorry Sean um, that holidays are a time logistically when families get thrown together and uh, my dad is a recovering alcoholic and about twenty five years ago in the uh, sometime in the fall um, I was living in New York City and my brother was living in New York City uh, several things happened that. Basically, they were the straws that broke the camel's back. I said, enough of my dad's drinking. We have to take action. We need to stage an intervention. And my dad lives in Montana, my brother in New York City. It, we, we waited for the time that we were going to be home anyway, which was Christmas. So just it, that's how the timing came together. And, uh, you know, so I one of the things I associate with Christmas is pulling together – uh, a couple of my dad's law partners, his physician, um, obviously my brother and, and me. And uh, yeah, as interventions go, we ambushed my dad. We, you know, they all came over to his house and we talked for a couple of hours and, you know, hit him from all angles about how his drinking was out of control and convinced him. Uh, this is a good part of the story without too much trouble that he needed to go to rehab that day. And so the next part, the, the rest of that day, my brother and I, you know, uh, my, my dad packed up and my brother and I, we drove him a couple hours to another town in Montana and put him in rehab for 28 days. And, and then we returned to our hometown for a few more days with my mom. And then we flew back home to New York City. And that, my, that didn't completely get my my dad back on the the road to sobriety but it was a really big moment he had relapses after that but then another intervention staged uh, a couple years later and it was a, a done deal and he's been sober since so do you feel like that memory when you think about christmas is that indelibly branded in your brain but like when you think of the holidays that 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 always seems to come to mind it, it always it, i always think of it at christmas i don't necessarily think of it in the lead up to christmas and i don't dread Christmas because of it, 
but it, it's just, it goes into my whole perception of Christmas being positive but balanced. You know, I, I don't I don't see it for all the glitz that it is because I've had these these experiences. And that that's one of the worst that I've had around the holiday season. It tempers my view of, of Christmas. Well, but I think it points to the fact, and and this for individuals who have a faith system or not, I think the holidays have really lost what it is supposed to be about. And I think, you know, the, um, oh man, not the Miracle on 34th Street. What is the famous Christmas? It's a Wonderful Life. One of my favorite movies of all time. Okay. Because, oh man, you can't rock the, the cat jingle ears anymore. <laughs> is it hurting your noggin? I was feeling like I was hallucinating. Um, redemption is the point of that story, right? And And to me... That's the magic of Christmas, not perfect Christmas cards or, you know, um, whatever it would be, perfectly staged Hollywood uh, or hol holiday parties or whatever it would be, right? That this idea of um, family coming together, which then, but the, you, you, what you're talking about is balance. For some people, that's extremely painful. Um, the concept of, of stopping right? Like stop doing, slow down. Well, that's the exact opposite for some people. The concept of peace. Like, I mean, there's that beautiful story out of World War II, no, World War I, World War I, where the trench fighting that had occurred. That's right. And that there was this moment on Christmas Eve night where both sides stopped and they sang in their own languages, but a known tune, I believe it was Silent Night. That's yeah, my, yeah, I, I think, think it's right. Silent Night. You know, so one group singing in German, the other group singing in French and American. And yet there's this idea that this is supposed to be a time of year that's supposed to be different. And there is something that's supposed to be different about it, but we lose it. And I think that that's where then trauma or grief or um, avoidance or whatever it be sets in for people. And I don't know, you know, if you would say, okay, well, how would you fix it? I don't know what the simple answer to that question is. But I, I have in my head, like, I know what I wish it was. Well, one answer, I think there are multiple things. Well, one answer is to communicate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, communicate your needs to mm -hmm. the other people, to the people in your life, the people you're sharing the holidays with, um, your preferences. Uh, if something is bothering you, I, I think it's okay to share that. You don't want to be a constant complainer. But if you go the other way and you hold everything inside, then you're going to have a rebound, you know, you, then you get into grudges, and then, you know, January is really awful because you just regret all the things you didn't say to the people who are pissing you off. <laughs> all those family. And I think, you know, we had mentioned it earlier, but, like, it is okay to draw boundaries at Christmas. It's okay to say no. It's okay to say I don't want to do that. Or it's okay to say we'd like to do it differently. Or it's okay to say we're not going to participate. That is an okay thing to do with the holidays. You don't have to be all things to all people at all times. And that you can do what is in the best interest of your little nuclear family as opposed to what is in the best interest of everybody else's right. family. So we're, we're getting close to bringing this, bringing this in for a landing. Do you have any other final thoughts or tips for, for listeners and viewers about surviving the holidays? I mean, it's almost what we've talked about before, this idea of, of communication and, and understanding and expectations. And I think if you're a single human being, it's examining your own values and maybe trying to really proactively, like not waiting until December 15th to go, shit, what is it that I want to do? Right? So really giving some thought. I think if you are part of, um, you know, a partnership or a family, that you communicate with the other person, hey, you know, depending on what your year has looked like, you know, what 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 are your some thoughts about this year? Is there anything that you'd like to do differently? Is there anything that you really liked to keep the same? I mean, I just think it really does come back to this idea of communication and, and really sort of knowing and understanding what does it mean to have your own values around the holidays? What do they mean to you? And that they can mean different things and that that's okay. And that, I mean, I think to me that the trickle down effect of that is where you're going to find maybe that peace that people are looking for.